welcome everyone, and particularly we welcome um, Hasuk Chang, uh, the Hans Rising Professor, History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. He's had a very illustrious career, uh, author of many books or papers, um, co-founder of the Philosophy of Science practice and a committee member for the, uh, uh, the Integrated History and Philosophy of Science. And we were commenting that we heard uh, this uh, subject uh, about nine years ago when he spoke at an Integrated History and Philosophy of Science uh, talk here, which I found very interesting. So I'm really looking forward to this. It said that you know you've made it, uh, or it was in the 19th century said that you know you've made it if there was a cartoon of punch uh, made of you. Uh, and the academic equivalent be when people start writing books about you or about your thought, and people have started doing that about Hassock. So we're very privileged to have such uh, esteemed company today, and we very much look forward to uh, this talk. So thank you. Thank you very much, George, uh, for the kind introduction. I uh, thank you, Ellen, for making all the arrangement and thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many uh, old friends, uh, even though some of you are little circles. Um, good to meet all the rest of you. Um, since we don't have much time, I'll just get straight on to the presentation and hopefully the screen share will work again. And tell me if it yeah, is that good? So yeah, that uh, works. Uh, yeah, thank you, George. I'm going to rely on you to tell me if anything is going terribly wrong or if I uh, begin to overstay my welcome or any of it. Right. So um, thank you, everyone, again for being here. This is just a little slice of my um, ongoing project on the history of batteries and all things related to that, which I've taken to calling battery science in the 19th century. And today's theme is what I've called the challenge of everyday science. I, I hope that will, what, what the spirit of that is will become clear as we go. Uh, let me start us at the acknowledged beginning of battery science, the first invention of the battery, the so-called voltaic pile by Alessandro Volta in the year 1799. Um, this is Volta's original drawing of his apparatus. I, oh, I hope you can see my cursor um, moving around, pointing to things which will become more important later. And this is uh, just an easier view or, or to see what the pile was. Um, on the left, lower left corner is a picture of a, a contemporary apparatus that's been preserved. So it's basically, right, plates of two different metals piled up uh, in this linear configuration with the dark layers here, which are just some wet stuff, right? And this is a very easy instrument to make, and everyone who wanted to make it was making it at home, but it was quite hard to understand how it worked. So that, that's the immediate historical interest. And as an illustration of how easy it was to make this thing, let me show you what was actually the first printed announcement of Volta's battery, which was not Volta's paper, uh, because the news was leaked, as we would say uh, today. Um, the first account published was in, in a daily newspaper, the London Morning Chronicle, um, in May of 1800, before Volta's paper was published in the Philosophical Transactions. And, and some of you will know this story very well. Uh, that Volta sent his publication in the form of a letter to Joseph Banks, the president of the Royal Society in London, and he sent it in two installments, and the second one got very delayed in the post. Uh, this is wartime, right? 
and uh, Banks was waiting for the second installment to be to arrive before he would arrange the formal presentation at the Royal Society and the publication. And meanwhile, he had shared the first installment with various friends of his, one of whom told, um, showed uh, Voltaire's paper to Dr. Garnett, shown uh, here in this newspaper article, who was the chief lecturer of chemistry at the new Royal Institution, right before, um, well, he, his performance wasn't deemed good enough, and Humphrey Davy famously then got picked up by Count Rumford, and the rest, as they say, is history. But this brief article, which was, right, this is the whole page of the broadsheet, and it was this little article which re reported on the public lecture that Garnett had given at the Royal Institution the night before. And because it's too small, I, I'm going to give you this big picture um, of the crucial bit of the text in which the reporter described what Garnett's instrument was. Here we go. A number of pieces of zinc, each of the size of a half crown, the, the silver coin, were prepared, and an equal number of pieces of card, this right thick paper, cut in the same form. A piece of zinc was then laid upon the table and upon it a half crown, so zinc and then silver. Upon this was placed a piece of card moistened with water. Upon the card was laid another piece of zinc, upon that another half crown, then a wet card, and so alternately till more than 40 pieces of each had been placed upon each other. That's it. That's the description. And there are reports that people could literally just read this kind of report and make a voltaic pile at home. So kind of the opposite of the kinds of cases in which replication is so hard, you need a lot of tested knowledge and personal connection was necessary for successful replication. So really easy to make, but very hard to understand. Now the story I won't tell you uh, today is how Garnett got in trouble for diverging uh, this unpublished piece of research and he got into quite a lot of hot water, banks very angry and so on. So then um, when people looked at this instrument and tried to understand how it worked, it was not easy and there was no consensus, right? And historians who have written about this have written a lot about this opposition between the so-called contact theory and the chemical theory of the pile. The contact theory originated from Volta's own ideas, right? The very title of Volta's paper eventually published in Phil Trans later that year is very informative, right? The paper is called On the Electricity Excited by the Mere Contact of Conducting Substances of Different Kinds. You almost don't need to read the rest of the paper to get Volta's main idea. So here the idea is that, right, is contact of two different metals would excite the movement of electricity in one direction. And then the wet layer doesn't do anything except to convey, to conduct that electricity. And so it, the electrical fluid moving around goes to the next cell, and then the next cell has its own electrical activity, so it accumulates and onward. So in Volta's view, this is like a self-charging Leiden jar. It's a very electrostatic. Uh, point of view he had. And this on the right is a modern illustration of, of how Volta's battery works. And you, you can note that the unit, the cell, is different. For the cell, for the so-called chemical theorist, was the sandwich, right, of the wet stuff in between the two metals. And the view is that it's the chemical reaction between one of the metals, in this case zinc, and the wet stuff, uh, Volta had originally used just plain water. Uh, later he said he was using salt water. Why? Because it just conducted electricity, be electricity better. 
But in the chemical view, no, it's crucial that it's not plain water. It's something like salt that reacts with the zinc and um, creates a flow of electricity. And then the function of the other metal in this view is simply to conduct that electricity. So uh, Kuhn, you might have seen this picture, actually used this as a convenient illustration of incommensurability. Now, um, here's Helia Krau, um, who has written a, a very, very nice summary of this whole dispute um, about the mechanism of the voltaic pile. Uh, he says this, right, what makes the voltaic controversy both interesting and unusual is its long duration and complex structure. It says, none of the great theoretical advancements of the 19th century could settle this issue. And he says the debate sort of died down and then it was revived in the late 19th century. And yes, people stopped sort of talking about it. But even in the 20th century, uh, there was no consensus on whether what Voltas, Voltas are, well, what later people called the voltaic contact potential was real. And uh, there's lots about this in the forthcoming book I'm writing, and there really was no clear consensus theoretically in well into the 20th century. And Krau says that, right, there's not, this is in the year 2000, there's not good enough history about this yet. And Kenneth Kniva had earlier said the subject is in need of a major historical study, so that is what I'm trying to provide. But uh, I don't have time today to give you the details of what I'm actually working up in the book. So here's a right one snapshot of what the whole book looks like. Um, it's a pluralist view, right? I identify four different systems of practice, as I call them, a bit like paradigms. Uh, I can go into the differences if anyone wants in the question period. I'm identifying at least four different systems, so not just the opposition between contact and chemical theory. Um, the contact and chemical theories I see as embedded in these two different systems, which I call contact electrostatic going back to Volta and the chemical imbalance system, as I call it. And then there are two others. One is the conservationist system based around the idea of energy conservation, which no, right, neither contact nor chemical theories were thinking about, right? Because the notion of energy doesn't come into later anyway, and even the previous steps to the 1840s energy discovery uh, were disconnected from these first two systems. And then there's what I call the corpuscular mechanical system, which really tries to get the microscopic story about how things work. And, and that does go back to Davy and Berzelius and so on quite early on, but again, um, not closely connected with the first three systems, which are not micro molecular like that. And then um, the second part of the book um, notes that actually even these four systems uh, framing isn't enough to describe what's going on because there were lots of problems that actually couldn't be solved nicely in any of these four systems. So we see lots of ad hoc inter system integrations, which we see um, in the examples like the dry cell, which I'm going to mention briefly today. So that in two minutes is the whole book. Now, what I want to focus on today is what's in blue in this slide. So, you know, when, when I tell people that um, I'm writing a history of batteries, a lot of people these days, they get very excited because they think I'm, I'm going to sort out their mobile phone or laptop battery, batteries, or at least I would talk about the lithium ion batteries, or all these 
cutting edge things and I tell them, well, you know, I kind of stopped before the electron is discovered and, and they get very disappointed. But um, that perspective, right, of the scientists or engineers of today is that underlying that perspective is this idea that, well, I mean, something like the voltaic pile is completely well understood now and that prehistory that they as they see it of the 19th century is just a curiosity right oh yeah you you historians like to do that kind of thing but it's not currently relevant and the the message i want to convey today if nothing else is that that's not quite right um the scientific questions weren't so easily sorted out now if you ask how does a battery work today um well i mean the chemistry students learn it at least by the time they get to high school right what in england is the a levels or even at gcse uh, this kind of picture is given this is a picture of the Daniel cell, as we say, right. So what is a battery? The textbook picture is that, well, this battery is two different metals, yes, as before, each of it which is dipped in a solution of itself, as it were, right. So the zinc electrode is, in this case, immersed in a solution of zinc sulfate, uh, which is full of zinc ions, and the crucial reaction here is the redox, reduction oxidation reaction, right? Zinc can go into zinc ion by losing two electrons or vice versa. So what is the reaction potential involved in that reaction and how does it work against or with, right, what's going on on the other side? So here is copper immersed in a solution of copper sulfate. Again, right, copper can go into copper ion or turn back. And what happens in this battery is zinc has a stronger tendency to lose um, electrons, right, than copper. So electrons will flow in that direction and a porous barrier here between the two solutions allowing the flow of ions so that we can have a circuit, right? And the standard potentials, you can easily look up on the table and the difference between the two tendencies, right? On the two sides will give you the overall cell voltage. So the typical Daniel cell has 1.1 volts and that's supposed to be all very straightforward. Here's another picture of the Daniel cell. And this all goes back to John Frederick Daniel, the first professor of chemistry at King's College London, um, who invented this thing. And there's a nice long story I tell in the book about how we came from that to that. And that's a long and interesting story. Daniel's original configuration, this is a cross-section view, looks very different because what he had was uh, two concentric cylinders rather than two square looking um, blocks side by side. And the porous barrier he used between the two solutions, you may be able to see, uh, it says here, ox gullet, right? He actually used biological membranes before he settled on unglazed clay. So very interesting story about how um, Daniel, who originally wasn't thinking right in the kind of framework which I call the imbalance framework, um, was somehow led into it step by step by making right a better battery. His aim was to make a steady kind of voltaic cell for his research and as it were nature's hand guided him towards the textbook configuration that we have today along with the theoretical framing of that. But the point today is this, the point I want to convey today is that this textbook account of how batteries work 
is really quite useless. Why? Because nobody uses a Daniel cell anymore. It was the thing to use in the mid to late 19th century, but we don't use that anymore. Um, and of course, another issue when we're thinking about the history of the voltaic battery is that the Daniel cell configuration is very, very different from the voltaic cell configuration. And this redox pot potential account of how the battery works doesn't really easily apply to the voltaic cell. And also, it doesn't explain your AA, AAA, whatever you stick into um, your devices, right? I mean, one of these things. Oof, that's uh, corroded, my old one. Anyway, show you a picture instead. Um, right, that, that's the ancestor of all of our ever ready Duracell, whatever you buy. Uh, the zinc carbon cell, right, which has a carbon rod instead of a metal in the middle and the zinc is in the casing. So carbon here replaced the more inert metal and it's filled with a rather complicated electrolyte in between the two. And that is our literally iconic battery, right? There, there are people who have no idea, right, uh, why the battery icon looks like this. It is just the shape of the old carbon zinc cell. And it's actually quite misleading to use that for the rechargeable batteries, the, the Akku of the German language. Um, completely different kind of animal, but uh, anyway, this is the icon we're stuck with. But the point is, right, that the nice textbook account of the Daniel cell explains neither the voltaic cell nor the dry cell. Um, originating from the carbon zinc type. And if you ask how does the standard dry cell work, uh, textbooks don't tell you that very much. I found one which comments on it, uh, a very interesting chemistry textbook by Carl Snyder, American chemist, called The Extraordinary Chemistry of Ordinary Things. He says, uh, yeah, the chemistry that goes on inside that wet black paste, mostly consisting of these chemicals, is much too complex to be described in detail here. And here is a first year university level chemistry textbook. So that's interesting, right? And you look up um, other sources which try to explain why we get the standard 1.5 volts in that little device, that's actually not very easy to figure out. Here's an attempt by whoever wrote the entry on Wikipedia uh, on the zinc carbon battery, which is one of the few actual attempts I've seen. And yeah, that author says, yeah, the overall reaction is like this on the, um, in the basic zinc carbon cell, but he said, you know, lots of other reactions are possible. And this author tries to tell us why we get 1.5, but here, minus 076 and plus 05, the difference between that is nothing like 1.5. So it's left hanging and in a, in a later edition of that article I've seen that that's been deleted. So um, the zinc carbon dry cell that was already being sold in great numbers by the end of the 19th century. Um, here's a very informative author of that time, Essa Bottone, um, who, who taught at Finsbury Technical College in London. He tried to explain it. Actually, he, he picked up a cell uh, dry cell and analyzed it, had it analyzed by a, a colleague, and it was just really complicated. And of course, the precise formula of that cell was a trade secret on the part of General Electric. So um, he had to do his own chemical analysis, he, his colleague uh, to begin with. Now, uh, the time is rushing by, so let me conclude with 
just a few points about what to take away from a, a very quick glimpse of this complicated story. And first of all, I, I want to note right something I didn't tell you much about, which is the fact that electric circuits driven by the battery really were the foundation of the fundamental theories as well as experiments and technologies that, that really constituted the cornerstones of the modern technological civilization. And, and I emphasize the thing about theories because, I mean, our very basic conceptions like voltage, current and resistance, right? That only arises because the battery was invented, which led to the existence of circuits with steady current and Ohm's law follows two and a half decades later. I think Charlotte Connolly is in the audience who's been writing a, her PhD on this. Anyway, uh, so one, one way to put this point is that there are no electric circuits in nature, right? It's a human creation, and now we try to understand bits of nature, even bits of bi biological organisms in terms of circuits, but that is an engineering metaphor that, that we have imposed on descriptions of nature. But the point here is Volta's battery created these material conditions in which the most fundamental concept of our electrical science arose. So in carrying on in the same vein, I know, uh, characterize um, what I call battery science as an amalgamated science, which, which is a bit like techno science, as people often mean it, but there are some differences. But the, the main sense is that the theory, experiment, technology, commerce, all of that is in a seamless whole um, developing together. A comment, uh, something to think about the uh, Daniel Cell is how that really became the textbook battery. Uh, and that's a long and complicated story because if you look at the textbooks of the 19th century until the very end of the century, the Daniel Cell is not presented as the standard theoretical battery, right? The Daniel cell is a standard in the lab. It serves for a time as a very credible unit even of voltage because it is steady and nothing else was so steady until um, things like the commercial dry cell um, were invented and, and developed to a high standard. But theoretically, it wasn't understood um, in the way that uh, we do. And that, that was a long, complex process of what I have called aim-oriented adjustment. One other thing to note is this issue of pluralism. Now, there were various valid ways of making and understanding and using batteries, which is what I try to articulate in terms of the four systems. The focus today has been um, the fact that the most mundane of batteries, right? And I talked about two prime examples, the voltaic pile itself and the dry cell, right? The very first, very simple battery ever invented and at the other, chronologically at the other end of my story, these absolutely reliable little devices that are a huge commercial success and uh, I mean, we don't even think anything of these little devices working for an entire year without um, performance deteriorating. When Daniel invented his cell, the previous standard, I mean, you were lucky if you could keep a voltaic cell steady for two minutes. But the point is that these mundane batteries are not easily explained by what today's science students learn. And that is what I've called the tragedy of everyday science, um, in which a lot of interesting and important phenomena that, that we have such easy access to in everyday life are obscured by 
our cutting edge current scientific focus, both cutting edge and the textbook, right? Um, focus of current science. And I think it's an interesting lesson that cutting edge science is not necessarily the best science for our purposes. I think I've already gone a full half hour, so I'm going to stop now and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that uh, very interesting and excellent talk, Hasok. Now, we'll uh, show our appreciation in, in the usual way. <laughs> if you haven't got your microphone on, you can always use the clapping icon in your... Uh, thank you.